A note to our listeners. This episode contains descriptions of marital abuse that some might find distressing. Please be advised. Also, we're going to swear a lot. I mean, honestly, it's what Elizabeth would want. For such an elegant lady, she had the mouth of a sailor. Imagine the most spectacular, elaborate, expensive celebrity wedding in history. Okay, Nick and Priyanka. (laughs) Way bigger. Kim Kardashian and Chris Humphreys? (laughs) Okay, let's back up a little bit. First of all, it's 1950. And that woman who's singing Ave Maria to a chapel full of celebrity guests? She works for MGM, the film studio. So do all the florists who are running around getting the orchids ready for their close-ups. And ditto for the photographers who are stalking the aisles and snapping shots of the ridiculously photogenic guests. I mean, the only person here who isn't on the studio payroll is the archbishop who's going to officiate. Everyone here is in the chapel because of one guy, Louis B. Mayer, the head of the studio. And he's sitting up front, dabbing his eyes with a white silk handkerchief. Is it his daughter that's getting married? Kind of. You could say he raised her taught her everything she knows. Where to go, when to eat, what to say, how to act. I don't like where this is going. Yeah, she's on the payroll too. Her name is Elizabeth Taylor. And while she'll grow up to be one of the most powerful movie stars in Hollywood, right now she's just an 18-year-old girl promoting a movie. Wait, hang on. Is this a wedding or not? Oh, it's 100% a real wedding, but it's also been time to coincide with Liz's new film, Father of the Bride. MGM asked Liz to time her own wedding to the film premiere? Oh, you have no idea. MGM didn't just pick the date, and they didn't just script the entire ceremony word for word either. They even picked the groom. Wait, what? Yep, welcome to the 20th century Hollywood studio system. It's full of beautiful people who've traded in their free will for the promise of fame and fortune. In the 90210 zip code, arranged marriages are part of the deal. I can't believe Elizabeth said yes to this. I'm having anxiety just thinking about it. Yeah, I know. She said yes. But that's the thing about Liz. Even when it seems like she isn't in control, she always does a little something to remind you that she is. Look at any photo from that wedding day, and you'll see exactly what Louis B. Mayer wants you to see. Perfect dresses, perfect teeth, perfect hair. But on the other side of the frame, out of sight of all those cameras, Liz is saying her vows with her fingers crossed behind her back. She's basically giving MGM the middle finger. Because if MGM is going to make her get married, then she's going to find a way to fight back. Louis B. Mayer might think he's the king of MGM, But Elizabeth is its princess, and she has a plan. She's going to take down the studio system from the inside. From Wondery, I'm Brooke Sifrin. And I'm Arisha Skidmore-Williams. And this is Even the Rich, where we bring you absolutely true and absolutely shocking stories about the biggest celebrities the world has ever seen. It's a show about power. How you get it, how you keep it, and what happens when you nearly lose it all. It's also about how the rich are just like us. Because even the rich fall in love and break up and struggle. And cry every week during This Is Us. That's the champagne. So, Arisha, do you like bedtime stories? Only if Samuel L. Jackson is reading them to me. Well, I'm no Sam Jackson, but I do have a bedtime story for you and this glass of warm milk. Oh, okay. I'm in. Once upon a time, there was a magical kingdom that was controlled by an evil king. If you lived here, this tyrant decided everything about your life, from your haircut to who you'd marry. Most everyone went along with this because the king made the rules. He could raise you through the ranks or he could banish you. But there was one young woman in the kingdom who wanted to call the shots. She wanted to live life and marry on her own terms. So she set out to find her equal. But because she was so brave and fearless, that wouldn't be easy. She'd have to kiss a lot of frogs before she met her match. 
This is a four-part series on Elizabeth Taylor, one of the very first Hollywood movie stars whose private life was even more dramatic than the movies she starred in. And this is episode one. You and your studio can go to hell. This fairy tale begins with a beautiful seven-year-old girl named Elizabeth. She's a daydreamer with deep, violet blue eyes that would stare off into space. Her mother and father would look at each other and wonder, what on earth is she dreaming about? Sometimes it's ponies, sometimes fairy kingdoms, until one day, one day in a movie theater, all her dreams come into focus. She's watching the biggest child star of the time, Shirley Temple, in a movie called The Little Princess. And this isn't just any movie theater. It's on an ocean liner packed with people trying to get out of England ahead of World War II. And that includes her family, who's returning to the U.S. after years of living abroad. The mood on board is tense. Everyone in the screening room is relieved to have a movie to escape into. But for young Elizabeth, this movie doesn't feel like escape. It feels like home. She sees the costumes and jewelry and elaborate sets. Beautiful people saying all the right things and a cute little girl no one can take their eyes off of. This is what her life should look like. So she turns to her mom in the dark theater and she says, Mommy, I want to be an actress. And the person behind her says, Shh, we're in a movie. (laughs) Exactly. Sarah looks back at Elizabeth like, you're goddamn right you do. Because Elizabeth's mom, Sarah, didn't set out to be just Elizabeth's mom. Sarah always thought she'd grow up to be the star of her own season of Even the Rich. Except things didn't work out for Sarah. She got married, had kids, and her prospects dimmed. Until that day in the movie theater. Oh no, I sense a stage mom alert. Big time. Okay, so then... Is dad in the picture at all with this? I don't know. I don't really think they even asked him. He was drunk most of the time, so he probably didn't get a vote. Her dad wasn't exactly a mover and a shaker, but Elizabeth and her mom, they're locked in. They know what they want. They're going to take Hollywood by storm. Elizabeth and Sarah move to Los Angeles, and they try really hard to make their mark in Hollywood. I'm guessing they don't become valets. (laughs) Yeah, they couldn't drive stick. (laughs) Classic. But wait, that must mean she never gets to meet her soulmate and lifelong genius collaborator and partner in crime. Yeah, I mean, Elizabeth never had a career like ours, that's for sure. It's just her and her mom. And her mom, Sarah, is throwing her at every suit with a pulse in Southern California. Now, Elizabeth is stunning. Even as a little kid, she's got these chiseled cheekbones and sharp arching brows. But at all the casting calls, auditions, and parties, no one's interested. Because right now, child stars have a very specific look, and it's Shirley Temple's. Casting directors want someone with big round cheeks and cute little dimples. Even though Elizabeth is small for her age, there's still something too grown up about her. But Elizabeth is not going to give up. She keeps putting herself out there going wherever her mom tells her to go, meeting whomever her mom tells her to meet. And eventually, it pays off. MGM's shooting the latest Lassie film when they make a horrible discovery. The female leads had a growth spurt. She's now a full head taller than the boy who plays Lassie's owner. They need a short girl with a British accent stat. A producer at MGM is like, Wait, who was that annoying stage mom who kept talking about her daughter? The short one, with the British accent. (laughs) And Elizabeth gets the role. It's not exactly her big break. She makes $100 a week. Lassie makes $250. (laughs) But she gets her foot in the door at MGM. And in the early 1940s, MGM is where you want to be. It's where all the biggest stars are. Their slogan is, more stars than there are in heaven. We're talking Clark Gable, Katherine Hepburn, Judy Garland, Fred Astaire, Sidney Poitier. This is the studio that, in just one year, made Gone with the Wind and The Wizard of Oz. You can't get any bigger. And it's all run by the most important man in Hollywood, Louis B. Mayer. (laughs) 
Fresh off her work in Lassie, Elizabeth and Sarah are invited to meet him. Elizabeth feels the sweat break out on her forehead as she stares up at the tall, white, marble tower that houses Mayor's office. She pictures him looking down over his massive kingdom. In her mind's eye, he's a tall, imposing man with a military bearing and a dignified, trustworthy face. But it turns out, she's way off. When she meets Mare, he's almost her height. His hand when they shake hello is plump and sweaty. And the look in his eyes as he takes in her and her mother isn't dignified or trustworthy. He looks at her like he's inspecting merchandise and he's ready to haggle. After that meeting, Elizabeth comes up with her own nickname for Mare, Rumpelstiltskin, the freaky little fairy tale goblin who promises a young woman riches beyond her wildest dreams. But in exchange, he takes her baby. Sounds like my first agent. Yes, and I hope you get your baby back. But let's just (laughs) say, there's gonna be a price. Not that Elizabeth or Sarah is ready to think about that right now. They exit the meeting with a seven-year contract. It's not a well-paying contract, but it's a start. And they're already thinking ahead to the next step. Making Elizabeth a star. It's 1943. And a typical day at MGM, the biggest, most powerful film studio on the planet. Thousands of crew members are hard at work on 15 different sound stages, painting jungle backdrops, building houses, and even assembling battleships for the various movies in production. And 11-year-old Elizabeth Taylor is unfazed. She and her mom are on a mission. They're looking for someone, a top director named Clarence Brown. This guy's a big deal. He's worked with Joan Crawford and Greta Garbo. Elizabeth knows he's a star maker, and she knows he's about to direct a movie called National Velvet. It's the story of a young English girl who rides her prize pony to fame and fortune. It's perfect for Elizabeth. I mean, first of all, England. She's lived there. Her English accent is almost as good as mine. (laughs) And second of all, horses. This role is her Shirley Temple moment. It's her turn to be the little princess, and she knows it. Which is why when she and her mom spot the director that day at the studio, they're on him like white on rice. Sarah heads him off in an alleyway between sound stages, and she's like, this is my daughter. She's perfect for the lead in National Velvet. And Elizabeth smiles up at him and bats her eyes and says, it's my favorite book. But Clarence Brown has been around for a long time. He's seen ambitious young wannabes and their stage moms before. So he knows what to do. He just turns around and walks the other way. Mm, One of my favorite responses. (laughs) Yes, but they don't give up. Sarah and Elizabeth stay right on him. Sarah goes left, Elizabeth goes right. And Sarah just keeps saying, you've got to give her this part. She's perfect. She's amazing. And Elizabeth is like, just give me the chance. I know I can do it. But Clarence keeps walking, past soundstage after soundstage, until finally he realizes they're not going to stop. He says she's too young, and at least three inches too short. Paging that original female lead in Lassie. (laughs) Yeah. Elizabeth takes the news in stride, because now she has a goal. She needs to grow. She's going to make it happen, starting with breakfast. Elizabeth sets up shop at a local diner every morning and orders what they call the farm breakfast. Two hamburger patties, two fried eggs, hash browns, and silver dollar pancakes. And she orders two of those breakfasts, so she's eating four of everything. Every day. And it works. Kind of. I mean, really, it's just that she's 11 years old and still growing. By the time they're ready to start casting, she's just tall enough to audition. And when Clarence Brown views her screen test, it's undeniable. The camera chooses Elizabeth Taylor. He'll later say, There's no way of knowing in advance whom the camera will love. Our camera loved Elizabeth Taylor, and it would love her for decades to come. In 1945, when she's 13, National Velvet hits theaters. MGM's Children's Matinee presents National Velvet, about a race called the Grand National and a girl named Velvet, whose biggest dream was to win it. And the movie is a hit. Across America, everyone's talking about Elizabeth Taylor. 
they can't get enough of those deep blue eyes, that jet black hair, or those impossible cheekbones. Don't forget that smile. Yeah, about that. Remember I said there would be a price for all of this? Mm -hmm. Well, Louis B. Mayer didn't take her baby, but he did take her baby teeth. Elizabeth still had a couple of them, and he decided they had to go. MGM replaced those teeth with fake ones and fitted her with braces. If she was going to be a star, she needed the perfect studio system approved smile. And that's just the start of it. Now that Elizabeth's a household name, MGM is involved in every aspect of her life. She's enrolled in MGM's Red Little Schoolhouse, where all of MGM's most important child actors go. School is in quotation marks for the record. Here's her average day. School in the morning, if there's time. Between classes, there's costume fittings and camera tests. She takes her school exams and costume between scenes. Then there's dance classes, rehearsal, and walking lessons. What the hell are walking lessons? <laughs> there's something they call the metro walk. All the girls have to learn it. You suck in your stomach, square your shoulders, and step off with your right foot. Okay, got it. Right, not left. Right. Yeah, I've been doing it with the wrong foot my entire life. God, it's so embarrassing. Every little detail is stage managed. It's the trade-off you make. If you're a star at MGM, you get everything you want. But the studio calls all the shots. Okay, but what if what you want is for them not to call the shots? I'm sorry, tough tits. If you want to throw a party, MGM pays for it, but they pick the guests. If you want to travel, they pay for that too. But they tell you what to wear and where to be so the press can get good coverage. Okay, so basically you're a doll and MGM's just moving you from room to room in their million-dollar dollhouse. <laughs> exactly. Just shut up and look pretty. You're not supposed to have your own thoughts or, God forbid, complain. But Elizabeth Taylor isn't like the other kids. She pushes back. Like on the set of one of her movies, Little Women... All the other child actors are dutifully lining up to get their eye drops. A snow scene's coming up, which means cornflakes in the eyes. What's that now? <laughs> so cornflakes are what they use back in the day for snow. But unlike snow, cornflakes are hard and jagged. And when they blow them into the frame, they can easily fly into actors' eyes, which really, really hurts. Can you guess what MGM's solution is? Oh, I don't know. Maybe don't hurl cereal at children's eyes? No, silly. You put anesthetizing drops in the actor's eyes. If you blink during a close-up, you ruin the scene. So all the kid actors have to line up for eye drops, so they just, you know, won't feel their eyes anymore. Problem solved for everyone but Elizabeth. She steps out from the line and basically says, yeah, I'm not going to do that. The adult actors are all like, what a fucking diva. Who does she think she is making choices? You don't get to make choices at MGM. And things really hit a breaking point when Elizabeth gets the script for her next movie, a picture called Sally in Her Alley. It's about as good as it sounds. And Elizabeth knows her worth. So she does what no one in the history of MGM has ever done before. She storms that white marble tower and marches right into Louis B. Mayer's office. Her mom, Sarah's with her, but she takes a less confrontational approach. She wants to support her daughter, but she really doesn't want to rock the MGM boat. She thinks she can sweet talk Louis B. Mayer, which you can't. He explodes at Sarah. He tears into her, screaming about how he found them in a gutter. Okay, well, that's just simply not true. They came to America <laughs> in a boat with a movie theater inside it. Totally. But this guy is furious. Veins are popping out of his neck. His face is turning red. He becomes this ferocious, intimidating monster. Full Weinstein. And then Elizabeth tells him to shut up. Damn, this girl is inspiration. <laughs> she tells him he can't talk to her mom like that. He's totally stunned. She's only 14. And then she does the unforgivable. She stares him right in the face and says, you and your studio can go to hell. Hmm. Then she tells him that she's never setting foot on MGM soil again. And she marches right out of Louis B. Mayer's office. She's had it. Damn, hell of a way to stand up for yourself. Yeah, well, it's not that simple. For one thing, Sarah doesn't storm out with her. They're not in lockstep on this one. She's still back in Louis's office, smoothing things over. 
But one thing is clear. The clock is ticking on Elizabeth Taylor, child actor. It's not just about Sally in her alley. This is about Elizabeth getting to choose. To say, I want this, I don't want that. She wants to be in charge of her own destiny. She wants to make her own choices. She wants to be her own woman. And that's not going to be easy, because it's still 1946. She's a teenager butting heads with the most powerful man in Hollywood. And there's no way in hell Louis B. Mayer is going down without a fight. Personal style is a journey, not a destination. Ugh, preach. (laughs) I feel like I constantly want to switch things up, but it's really hard to do that sustainably. You know what I mean? Oh, I definitely do. But see, that's why our sponsor Tradesy is making it simple to recirculate pre-owned clothing and accessories as your style changes. Yeah, Tradesy makes it possible to build your dream wardrobe filled with authentic designer items. We're talking Chanel, Dior, Louis Vuitton, Fendi, and so much more for up to 90% off retail. They even make it easy to split your payments into multiple installments with Affirm, which means that Prada bag you've always wanted is no longer out of reach. They're also redefining sustainable luxury by keeping fashion waste out of landfills and extending the life cycle of luxury goods, so you can invest in high-quality items that will last. Yeah, I don't know when I decided this, but I've recently decided that I'm going to be a sunglasses girl, the girl that wears cool sunglasses. And I have managed to get a Prada pair, a couple Mm. of Fendi pairs, Tom Ford. I didn't even know I liked Tom Ford sunglasses. And oh my (laughs) gosh, they are so nice. And the quality, I think Mm. almost all of them have been unworn before. And so it's just amazing stuff up to 90% off. And it looks really good. And everyone thinks that I'm way more fashionable than I am. (laughs) Major plus. (laughs) Just go to Tradesy.com to get $100 off your first purchase of $500 or more with Code Rich. Keep in mind, Tradesy prices are already up to 90% off, and now they're giving you an extra $100 off. That's T-R-A-D-E-S-Y dot com for $100 when you spend $500 or more on your first purchase with Code Rich. Come see what your closet's been missing. Visit Tradesy.com today. First-time buyers only. Other terms and conditions apply. Visit Tradesy.com for details. It's 1947. Elizabeth and Mayer have called an uneasy truce. She's staying at MGM, but she's off Sally in her alley. And she doesn't have to sit at the kids' table anymore. She's going to start playing adult roles. It's a tricky transition from child star to more adult roles. Shirley Temple's career stalled out when she entered her teens. Turns out, nobody wanted to see their favorite tap-dancing toddler kiss adult men. But Elizabeth always looked more like a miniature woman than a kid. She never really made sense as a child actor. So MGM has a real shot at making this happen. They just need to make sure that audiences are seeing Elizabeth grow up on screen and off screen, too. They need Elizabeth to start dating. Wait, does that mean she actually gets to live her life for a moment? No, don't be crazy. She's still in the dollhouse. But now MGM's looking for the perfect Ken doll to stick in there with her. And an eagle-eyed MGM publicist finds one in a small story tucked away on the sports page. Glenn Davis, an All-American football player and West Point graduate. He's coming to L.A. to play an exhibition game with the Rams. It's perfect. A Navy officer with broad shoulders and an MGM-quality smile. And the romance comes with a built-in ending. Glenn's being shipped out to Korea in just a few months. MGM sends Elizabeth and Glenn out on a couple dates, and the fan magazines that cover Hollywood gossip eat it up. She poses in his letterman jacket and wears a tiny gold football pendant he gave her around her neck. But Glenn Davis plays the part of MGM's Ken a little too well. He's handsome and wholesome, but he's also boring. If Elizabeth's going to date, she wants to enjoy it. So instead of playing ball with the studio, Elizabeth goes rogue. She meets William Pauley Jr., the son of an American ambassador. While Glenn Davis is a blue-collar soldier and an athlete, William Pauley is cosmopolitan. He's sophisticated. And Elizabeth actually likes him. You gotta follow your heart. (laughs) Yes. There's only one problem. 
MGM's publicity department did a ton of work promoting Elizabeth's relationship with Glenn. Photos, press releases, interviews. The whole force of the studio was put behind that couple. So when Elizabeth's caught dating another boy, the fan magazines freak out. They act as if she's abandoning a national hero. How dare she jilt poor Glenn Davis, who's about to serve his country. And when the relationship with Bill Pauly ends, the fan magazines completely turn against her. One columnist writes, Our little Liz is turning into a real man-eater. Another columnist says that Elizabeth's behavior calls for a series of resounding smacks behind the bustle. (laughs) Okay, that is the most old-timey sentence I've ever heard. (laughs) Truly. But for MGM, the timing couldn't be any worse. Liz's next big movie, Father of the Bride, is already in production. If fans aren't invested in her love life, are they going to buy tickets to see her walking down the aisle? It's time for MGM to take control of Elizabeth's story, and they're going to take a page from their own script, literally. We're back in the church of the Good Shepherd in Beverly Hills, and Elizabeth's gliding down the aisle toward the groom MGM's picked out for her. He checks all of the studio's boxes. He's good looking, rich, and has a famous last name. You might have heard of it before. This is Conrad Nicholson Hilton Jr., dear old Paris Hilton's great uncle. Decades before Paris was in all the tabloids, Conrad Jr., or Nicky as most people call him, is the Hilton with the most heat. He's boyishly handsome but sophisticated, an heir to the Hilton Hotel empire. MGM thinks he's the perfect groom for Elizabeth. And to MGM's surprise, Elizabeth agrees. Because while MGM wants to spruce up her image, Elizabeth sees a very different opportunity here she sees an escape plan. This is 1951. She can't stay single and quit acting. She's her family's main breadwinner. And outside of acting, what can she do? MGM barely gave her a high school education. The way she sees it, she has two options. Put up with Mayer for the rest of her life, or marry Rich. And Mayer doesn't realize it, but he's just made her choice for her. Once she becomes a Hilton, she's only gonna act in movies she loves or maybe she'll quit acting entirely. She doesn't know yet, but she'll get to choose. So Conrad Sr. throws the reception at the Bel Air Country Club. And after all 700 guests make their way down the reception line, the newlyweds toss back some Dom Perignon and check into a resort overlooking the Pacific. Nikki visits the bar while Elizabeth changes into a silk negligee and waits for their wedding night to really begin. She's convinced herself she's utterly in love, and this is the start of her own fairy tale. But she waits and waits. Nikki's off making friends at the resort's bar and getting drunk from throwing back shot after shot after shot. He doesn't come back all night. Okay, so absolute shit groom. While Elizabeth wants to be a Hilton, Nikki wants to be the head Hilton the one who takes over the family business. But his dad, Conrad Sr., seems more and more likely to make his younger brother Baron his successor. Nicky still has a couple things going for him, though. He's the oldest and Conrad Sr.'s favorite. But he's lazy. According to an ex-girlfriend, he once shot out a ceiling light with a gun because he was too tired to get up and walk to the light switch. Okay, but is that laziness or innovation? I mean, I support you fully. He also flunked out of hotel school. His only claim to fame when it comes to the family business is inventing bigger pens to discourage hotel guests from stealing them. Oh, that was his idea? Yeah, but attaching them to a chain wasn't. Okay, hang on. So he just (laughs) made bigger pens and that was supposed to stop pen thieves? I feel like the only way that works is if they're the size of an adult leg. Listen, he's full of good ideas, okay? (laughs) Like, on his second night as a newlywed, he brings Elizabeth down to the bar with him. Okay. And then when she drinks too much and starts puking her guts out, he leaves her on her own and spends the rest of the night picking up women. Okay. But it gets worse. On the first night of their honeymoon aboard the Queen Mary, Nikki leaves her behind in their room again. On the second night, he leaves her behind and loses $100,000 gambling at the ship's casino. Up to this point, Elizabeth's still holding out some hope for the relationship. But that night, when Nikki stumbles back into their room, 
He's drunk and furious at the world. He walks right up to Elizabeth and, without saying a word, punches her in the stomach. What the fuck? Then he stumbles into bed and passes out. Elizabeth knows what she has to do. Tell me it starts with a D. Oh, it does. But MGM tries to talk her out of it. And her mom takes MGM's side. Hollywood divorces happen, but they can't happen this quickly. You have to give the fairy tale time to ripen, wither, and then all on its own drop off the vine. If you pluck the fairy tale away too soon, people feel like you've taken something away from them. But Elizabeth doesn't want to wait. She doesn't think she should have to wait. Hell no, she shouldn't. So on January 30th, 1951, Elizabeth marches into the Santa Monica courthouse and asks for a divorce. She's still just 18 years old. Hmm. She later says it's the first grown-up decision I ever made absolutely alone. And a really good one. Yes, but MGM was right to be scared. Elizabeth's just ended her fairy tale romance without any explanation, and the media loses its mind. I've got to read you some of these clips because <laughs> they're absolutely awful. The fan magazine photo play automatically blames the entire divorce on Elizabeth, calling her, quote, willful, flighty, and headstrong, and saying she doesn't know the meaning of love. And poor Nicky Hilton, they describe him as, an earnest citizen forging his hardworking way into his father's hotel kingdom. Yeah, looking at a pen and saying it should be bigger sounds like really hard work. Yeah, here's Nikki's one public statement after the divorce. He says, I have never seen such beauty in my life, but God, she can be difficult. God, what a dick. Yeah, but Elizabeth gets the last laugh. When Nikki dies, all of his obits start with, once wed to Liz Taylor. They don't even mention the pens. After the divorce is finalized, Nikki's out of her life for good. But the trauma of that experience isn't. Elizabeth starts drinking more to self-medicate. And now that she's an ex-Hilton, she can't afford to miss a beat at work. She's got to stay on MGM's frantic shooting schedule. The ink's barely dry on her divorce when she flies to London to start shooting Ivanhoe. But it's on the set of Ivanhoe that Elizabeth finds an answer to her problems. Kind of. Don't you dare say husband number two. <laughs> Okay, I'm just going to tell you that she meets an older British actor named Michael Wilding. He's mild-mannered and stable, and best of all, he's completely devoted to her. He's not rich, he's not famous, but he's the anti nikki and Elizabeth falls hard. And she gets to thinking, if her last love story turned the press against her, maybe a new love story could win them back again. It's 1951 at the Cartier store in Beverly Hills. Elizabeth is in her element. She passes by emerald necklaces and ruby pins, diamond brooches and gold tiaras. Oh, that's beautiful, she coos. Oh, that one too. Behind her, Michael Wilding delicately dabs his forehead with his handkerchief. He doesn't want Elizabeth to see him sweating. She points to a big fat sapphire ring. Michael, she calls back. This one has my name on it. He steps forward to take a look. A thick row of diamonds encircles the gemstone, and the sapphire itself is as big as a grape. He's practically trembling, but he's an actor, so he tries to keep his voice level as he says, it's beautiful, darling. Elizabeth turns around to look at him. She takes his handkerchief from his hand and pats his forehead herself. Don't worry, darling, she says. I'm buying it. The only decision we need to make is which finger to put it on. The jeweler behind the counter passes her the ring, and she places it over her left hand. Here over the third finger, or here over the engagement ring one. She looks up at him and tries to hold back a smile. I think it should be that one, don't you? Elizabeth's marriage proposal to herself does the trick. The media eats it up. And Elizabeth couldn't be happier. She's finally in the last year of her seven-year contract with MGM. And she and Michael move into her dream home. It's nestled on a long, winding road in Beverly Hills. Ivy and orchids cover the outer walls. Fan magazines start to call it the Snow White House. Okay, so she's finally giving everyone their fairy tale romance. Exactly. But Mayor still rules MGM. 
and he won't give up his princess that easily. Arisha, I'm a little bit psychic. Did you know that? I did not. Please say more about this. (laughs) Okay. I know for a fact that you're wearing parade underwear right now. (laughs) Okay. I actually legitimately truly am. (laughs) I love it. They're so comfortable. Okay. So maybe I'm not psychic. I just know that parade is the most comfortable underwear you own. So why wouldn't you be wearing it? I mean, you have sound logic there. Parade (laughs) makes the most incredibly comfortable creative basics in a variety of sizes from extra small to 3XL. Yeah, they've got boy shorts, a super comfortable thong, and recently they launched their first ever bralettes. And you guys have heard me talk about the bralettes before. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and talk about them one more time. (laughs) They're so comfortable. Um, I'm not a big normal bra wearer. I just think they're really uncomfortable. And... The bralette is kind of a mix between like a sports bra and a regular bra. It's just really comfortable. You barely know you're wearing it. And their underwear are nothing to shake a stick at either. Mm -mm. Parade's basics come in over 30 expressive colors, which means there are endless mix and match opportunities. (laughs) Currently, almost 100 percent of Parade's fabrics are produced using certified, non-toxic recycled content. And their packaging is 100 percent biodegradable and breaks down within 300 days inside a composting environment. For a limited time, our listeners, that's you, Richies, can get 25% off orders over $40 with code RICH. Just go to yourparade.com slash rich to get the creative basics you want and celebrate who you are today. One more time, that's yourparade.com slash rich. Promo code RICH for 25% off orders over $40. Mama, mama, la. Life in the Snow White house with Mike Wilding is different than Elizabeth expected. The house is beautiful, with a tinkling fountain in the front and orchids strewn around the grounds. But despite the idyllic life she'd planned for, living with Michael is mostly day after day of grumbled pleasantries in the breakfast nook, lots of marmalade and long, tense silences. Elizabeth bought this fairy tale house for her Prince Charming. But now that they're living together, It's like Michael's recast himself as Grumpy, one of the dwarfs. Elizabeth wants her prince back, but Michael just keeps moping around. Back in England, he was a rising star. He was the go-to actor for witty, sophisticated character studies. But in LA, that same sophistication doesn't land. It's like a dog whistle that Hollywood casting directors just can't hear. So Michael putters around their storybook house all day, feeling sorry for himself. I'm imagining very long, dramatic British sighs. Can sighs sound British? Yeah, like... Oh, (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) No. (laughs) And Elizabeth feels awful. I mean, she brought him here, and she knows how sensitive Michael is. She needs to find a way to make him happy and to get Hollywood to see his worth. And we know by this point that when Elizabeth Taylor sets her mind on something, she goes all the way. But this time, she might go a little too far. Her contract at MGM is up for renewal. This is the moment she's been dreaming of for years, when she can finally escape from the people who took her baby teeth, who set her up with Nikki Hilton, who threw cornflakes at her cornea. But the longer Elizabeth spends watching Michael sigh and stare out their storybook windows, the more determined she becomes. Being a grown-up means making sacrifices. She knows what she has to do. She tells MGM she'll renew with them. But only if they sign Mike to a contract, too. Damn. I know. She basically agrees to go back to prison for this guy to make their marriage work. And does it work? Actually, yes, kind of. I mean, from the outside, they settle into the routine of a happy Hollywood life. They have two boys, Michael and Christopher. They turn two bedrooms into nurseries and go on wonderful family vacations. There's zero drama, but also not really. Because on the inside, that Snow White house just keeps getting quieter and quieter. It fills up with all the stuff they're not saying to each other. Because here's the thing. MGM holds up its end of the deal, but their casting directors still don't get Michael. 
They offer him roles in B-movies with names like The Latin Lover, and he keeps turning them down. He's holding out for his big Hollywood breakthrough. Okay, then Elizabeth is back at MGM for nothing. Yeah, basically. And with even less leverage than before. Snow White didn't have a mortgage, but Elizabeth definitely does. So now she's saying yes to everything MGM throws her way. And they're all shit movies you've never heard of. There's Elephant Walk, Rhapsody, The Girl Who Has Everything, except a husband who talks. Elizabeth is getting tired. And deep down, she's starting to wonder if she got Michael all wrong. Maybe his gentleness is actually cowardice. Maybe his air of calm is lack of ambition. And maybe this isn't the fairy tale she thought it was. She thought she was Snow White, but she's actually Goldilocks. Nikki was too hot. Mike Wilding is too cold. Which means that her just right is still out there. Exactly. It's a sweltering hot summer afternoon in Los Angeles and a small group of Hollywood types are gathered in the backyard of heavyweight producer Mike Todd. Elizabeth's heard of Mike, of course. He's known for working outside the studio system and breaking box office records, but she's never laid eyes on him before. Mike is working the grill when Elizabeth and her husband come in. She watches Mike reach up and wipe the sweat from his brow, almost in slow-mo. They lock eyes. And between them, the heat of the fire and the smoke ripples through the air. This Mike isn't Hollywood handsome. He's short and stocky with a long nose and an even longer chin. His eyes are dark and deep set, but there's something about him. All night, her eyes keep finding their way back to him. Whatever group he's standing in, that's where people are laughing the loudest. He moves from group to group with a low-key swagger. She can always hear his voice across the yard, but he never talks over anyone. He's powerful, but not overpowering. She hasn't met many men who can strike that balance. And when he finally sidles up to her group and shakes her hand hello, a jolt of electricity shoots up her arm. They start talking, but now, after watching him all night, she can barely make eye contact. Every time her eyes meet his, He's studying her so intently, she has to look away. They talk about how he's raising money for his new film, Around the World in 80 Days, and how he used to make money as a kid. He'd sell abandoned umbrellas and hats he found on the street. He made a fortune. Now, she's the woman laughing loudly. She could keep talking to him forever. But then, the barbecue ends. She gets back in the car with the other Mike, her husband and they drive in silence. Elizabeth looks over at Mike Wilding with his puppy dog eyes and hang dog expression. There's a part of her that still loves this guy. She doesn't want to hurt him, but she's exhausted. She hears herself say, I admire men who can get whatever they want so long as they set their hearts on it. It's pretty clear to both of them that she is not talking about the man who is driving this car, or at least it becomes clear the next day when she files for divorce from Mike Wilding. I guess when you know, you know. Meanwhile, Mike Todd definitely has his sights set on Elizabeth Taylor, and he doesn't keep it a secret. He stomps into the MGM lot, brings her into an empty room, announces he's falling in love with her and wants to marry her, and stomps off. Elizabeth thinks he's out of his mind, but she likes it. He sends her a diamond friendship ring, which Elizabeth accepts. <laughs> All diamond rings should be friendship rings. And when she flies to Kentucky for a shoot, he calls her constantly. Every day they talk on the phone until late into the night. And he sends her a telegram that says, I love you, that comes with an emerald Cartier bracelet. The gifts never seem to end. Elizabeth would later say, Mike's courtship was like being hit by a tornado. Is it a good sign when you describe romance with something that kills lots of people? Well, it gets better. Elizabeth says the first time they make love, she thinks she's going into cardiac arrest. In a good way. They can't keep their hands off each other. When they finally get married, right after her divorce comes through, she's already two months pregnant. In Mike, Elizabeth's finally found her equal, her partner in crime. Someone who lives in the moment, who's stubborn and romantic, and who hates the studio system as much as she does. 
Sometimes she can hear Mike screaming through the door of his home office. That usually means he's on a call with MGM's top brass, trying to give her what she's always wanted, freedom from that studio. She's never loved a man as much as she loves Mike Todd. When we're separated, she tells a friend, we absolutely die. That sounds ominous. It is. And what happens next is gut-wrenching. This is episode one of our four-part series, The Life and Loves of Elizabeth Taylor. If you like our show, please give us a five-star rating and a review, and be sure to tell your friends. Follow us on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, The Wondery app, or wherever you're listening right now. Join Wondery Plus and The Wondery app to listen ad-free. You'll also find some links and offers from our sponsors in the episode notes. Please support them. By supporting them, you help us offer you this show for free. Another way you can support the show is by filling out a small survey at Wondery.com slash survey. We use many sources when researching our stories, like the New York Times and Vanity Fair. But we especially recommend Liz, an intimate biography of Elizabeth Taylor by C. David Heyman, and How to Be a Movie Star by William J. Mann. I'm Brooke Sifrin. And I'm Arisha Skidmore-Williams. Gene Leitenberg wrote this episode with editing by Lucy Gillespie and Alana Hope Levinson. Our audio engineer is Sergio Enriquez. Sound design by Marcelino Villopondo. Kate Young is our associate producer, and Dave Schilling is our producer. Our senior producers are Natalie Shisha and Ben Gray. Our executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Jenny Lauer-Beckman, and Marsha Louie. For Wondery. <laughs>